Today I'm sharing tips on creating realistic texture in colored pencil. For this project, I am working on the smooth side of Canson Me Tans. I'm using various colored pencils with Polychromos, Caran d'Ache, Derwent Lightfast, and Derwent Drawing, and of course my Touch Up Texture Titanium White Mixture, and Mona Lisa Odorless Mineral Spirits. You don't have to use all of the same supplies that I am. These are just some of my favorites. I will have links to all of the supplies that I'm using in the video description. Before we get started, if you are supporters over on Patreon, make sure to head over where you've got the real-time version of this lesson available for you now. If you are unfamiliar with Patreon, for as little as $4 a month, you get access to all of my longer one to two hour, sometimes three hour tutorials. I have over 200 available that you get instant access to in multiple mediums and a new one every single week. Except for last week, because it was a holiday. If you are interested in Patreon or you want to see what type of lessons I have available, head over to my Patreon video library where you can see what's there along with a sample of one of my lessons, a free two hour long demonstration. So you can see if you think that Patreon might be a fit for your learning style. So I started by using a regular graphite pencil and lightly drawing out my orange tangerine. I'm really not sure which this is. It was listed as an orange. I got the reference photo from either Pixabay or Unsplash. I forget which. But the goal on this one is I really wanted to focus on the texture. My reference photo did not have a whole lot of texture there. So the first tip I have for you today is hype up the contrast in what you can see in a reference photo. If it's kind of bland or a little bit smooth, but you know it, like here, an orange or a tangerine, whichever we decide to go with, would have that texture there. What little I can see in that reference photo, I'm going to hype up the contrast of. So that is my first tip on making something look realistic. Make your brights a little brighter, your darks a little bit darker, and that can really help create more detail in this case and texture. Now, as I lay my base layers down on this orange, you can, or tangerine, we'll just, we'll, or orangeline, I don't know, we'll just make stuff up. I'm doing multiple layers before I blend with odorless, odorless mineral spirits. You can see I'm in layer maybe three or four at this point, and I'm going to layer on top of layer on top of layer. I don't want to blend with odorless mineral spirits until I get a lot of pencil on that paper. Now, what happens if you blend with odorless mineral spirits before you have enough pigment on the paper is that there's nothing for the odorless mineral spirits to work with. So they don't really blend. You just, it looks rough. It looks pale. It doesn't give you that rich tone that we're going for here. So look how many layers I'm putting on. Now, the other thing I do want to point out because this is sped up so much, it looks like I'm just randomly scribbling everywhere. I am not. I'm working that pencil in small little ovals and circles and really getting good coverage on that paper. It's not just scribbling every which direction. I'm now using my Mona Lisa Odorless Mineral Spirits on a brush and blending this out. A lot of people ask if I'm using water. No, water's not going to do anything for you on this. Those are wax and oil-based pencils. So it kind of looks like what you would expect with a watercolor uh, pencil, which so I can understand why people would think that might be what I'm using here. But no, this is Odorless Mineral Spirits or a type of paint thinner. And that is what I use to blend that out. Now we need to let that dry completely before we go on to the next layer. If we don't, you can start to damage the tooth of the paper. If you were to rub that pencil, I mean, it's a, it's a hard point there. You rub that over wet paper, you're damaging it. And one of the things that we're constantly trying to do when we work in colored pencils is maintain the integrity of the paper. So if we damage it by putting that pencil over a wet area of the paper, you're going to have a really hard time getting future layers on top of that. Besides that, you could actually scuff up or create a hole in your paper depending on the type that you're using. So while I waited for the orange tangerine, whatever it is, to dry, I'm going to go ahead and work on the leaf. Just get a base layer there. I'm not worried about details at that point. So now that the actual fruit is dry, we can go ahead and start layering in the details. Now this is going to take a lot of layers. Don't expect your first layers to look how you want it to look in the end. It is normal for it to look kind of bad in the beginning. You're gonna go through some seriously ugly stages where you're thinking you're completely failing at whatever it is you're trying to do. You're not, you need to keep layering. Those ugly stages are just a normal part of the process. So I'm taking a darker reddish toned pencil here and you don't have to have the same colors. I don't even know what colors I used here. You look at your pencil set and go, okay, I need orange, grab an orange, or that needs to be darker orange, layer some red on top. It is very, it, it's a much more simple process in picking the colors that you want than a lot of people think that it is. People want to 
put too much importance on the color that you choose and it's not that big of a deal. What is a big deal are your values. Dark's dark enough, light's light enough. Those are the things that are going to make the biggest difference in your work looking realistic in the end. I'm just going to layer on top of layer as I, I do these. Now look at these little holes, what I'm doing, the little divots or I don't know, the texture, the little I'm just making up words again. The, those little spots, I don't just want spots. And that is important when you're trying to create texture. It's the same thing if you're doing wrinkles on or painting or drawing wrinkles on people. You don't just put lines. Or in this case, I don't just put dots. I need a highlight and I need a shadow. So really, most of these areas have three tones. I have my darkest value, slightly lighter. And then you can see where I'm taking the much lighter area and lining part of that little circle just on one side where the light is catching. That's what's making it look three, more three-dimensional. If I just put a dot to create the idea of texture, yeah, you look at it and go, okay, I know where you were going with that, but you didn't finish. So we need to get those highlights and deeper shadows all combined together in order to create that three-dimensional texture that we're trying to accomplish here. Again, same thing when you're doing people portraits where you've got wrinkles in the person's skin. You can't just put a line that doesn't look good. It will never look good. You have to go through and have some highlights and shadows in addition to that on each wrinkle. Drawing people that have wrinkles or elderly people are a lot of fun. It, it adds, you can add so much interest to the piece if you get those wrinkles correctly. But if you're just putting random lines, it, it's, it's not cute. It's, I, I, do, I do not recommend. Going through, adding a few details on the leaf. Now, one of the things that you want to watch when you are using a reference photo, which you should be if you're trying to create things realistically, pay attention again to your lights and your darks. I don't care if I've got the perfect shade of green. What I do care about, where are the light areas? Where are the dark areas? You want to look at it sort of as an abstract piece. I'm not looking at that going, I'm drawing a leaf. Because if I do, my brain is like, that's not what a leaf looks like. Let me fix this for you. And it doesn't end up looking like a leaf. So what I'm doing is just looking at the abstract shapes of where the lights and darks are. I'm throwing some blue in here. This blue was a bit dark. It was giving me more of a green tone than I was hoping for when it mixed in with the orange, which obviously that was going to happen. I'm mixing complementary colors. But I was trying to create more of a lighter orange. So if I wanted that blue to stand out a bit more, I really should have put the blue down in those areas first and not try to layer it on top of orange. You've got to remember with colored pencil that whatever color you put on top of another color, those two colors mix together. That will always be the case. So trying to put blue on top of orange, that is going to mix. And I'm going to get this brownish green in this case uh, color, which was fine. It, it works for this one. But if I wanted that to be really blue, which was my initial goal, I had to change it part way through because I was making a mess blending blue into orange. I don't know why that thought didn't cross my mind beforehand, but if I really wanted that area to be blue, I would have needed to put the blue there first so it didn't mix in with the orange. Just remember that whenever you're working with colored pencil, when you layer one color over another, they will mix together at least a little bit. Another quick tip with that is sometimes you have something happen where you're like, huh, wasn't really what I wanted. Work it, work through it. Don't give up. Don't throw it away going, well, I really wanted that to be more blue. Does it matter? Does it, is it a big enough deal that you're just not going to finish the piece? Finish the piece, learn from it and do it differently next time. But don't give up because something didn't come out perfect, exactly what you had envisioned in your head. I've got a little bit of a shadow here. Now with this, I'm not blending with odorless mineral spirits. I don't want to get a oily mark on the white of the paper. Really, it's more of a grayish paper. But I don't want to leave that oil mark because I'm not filling the background in with colored pencil. I just wanted the shadow underneath. So all I did was take a white colored pencil and burnish over it. And by burnish, I mean I added a lot of pressure and that's it jammed the pencil into the paper and that is how I blended that out. Now burnishing is a great technique to use in colored pencil, but I typically recommend keeping it to your last layers. If you burnish or push really hard with that pencil to blend early on, it limits how many layers you can get afterwards because you've just flattened the tooth of the paper. Like I was saying earlier, one of our goals is to maintain the integrity of the paper, the tooth of the paper. If we flatten that out, we just limited ourselves. So just keep that in mind when if you do burnish where you're pushing hard for blending, keep it for your last layers. And when you're working where you're leaving the background color, just the paper showing through as your background, that is something to be careful of because it can leave an oil spot when you blend with the odorless mineral spirits. So I want to make sure I don't get OMS on that background. 
Here I am using Touch Up Texture and Titanium White mixed together, and this is the only archival white that you can paint on top of colored pencil. I've had people ask if they can just use use acrylic paint or gel pens. Yeah, you can, but it's not going to be archival. That will chip over time because you're then putting a water-based product on top of a wax or oil-based pencil. So the Touch Up Texture Titanium White Mixture from brushandpencil.com, the only one that I recommend for adding highlights like this, and it is a must-have for me with colored pencil. And I have a video, I'll have a card pop up showing you that video of how to use this product. Now, as you can see, this is really harsh. We don't want to leave it that way. I'm going to soften it out. The great thing about the Touch Up Texture Titanium White Mixture is it adds tooth to the paper. That's what the Touch Up Texture is for. So what I can do when that dries is just go right over it lightly with my colored pencil and soften it out. So I've still got a highlight that shows up really well. It's a nice crisp line, but I can tone it down by putting that colored pencil right over it. And in this case, I'm going with the Polychromos colored pencil because it's a more translucent pencil. So it works more like a glaze would with oil or acrylic painting, where you can still see the details underneath, but you're tinting the color. Hyping up the contrast here, taking some more reds and darker oranges. Now make sure when you use the Touch Up Texture and Titanium White Mixture, let that dry completely, at least 10 minutes, I would say. It'll feel dry to the touch, go longer, maybe go 20 minutes. The longer you let that dry, the better. If you put it on too thick, if you make your mixture really, really thick, or if you don't let it dry all the way, when you go on top with your colored pencil, it may flake off or chip off a bit. So as long as it's dry all the way, you can work your pencils back over it, no problem. But usually when I go back over it, I'm not pushing really hard with the pencil either. So another tip for you, tip for you there. Just some final details there with some highlighting. And sign it and we are done. There is our finished orange tangerine. I don't know, maybe it's a plum. But there we go. And then that is done on the Cans and Me Tens. As you've seen lately, I've been using that paper a lot more. I really like the tooth of this paper and it comes in a lot of different colors, the blues, the browns. This is not a sponsored video, but that is a paper I find myself using a lot more with colored pencil. And the more I use it, the more I'm liking that one. It, it's got a really nice balance. And you can see there on the photo, it's got a decent amount of texture, but not so much that you can't get the fine detail. So just a really nice paper to work on and fairly inexpensive to some of the hot white press watercolor papers that I typically use. My friend Stacy was visiting and dropped off a lot of new plants for me. So I figured I'd share some of them in the studio. This is one I already had. This is one of my favorite begonias. This one is a, I wanna say Parisian, swirl. I love these because they look like Tim Burton plants to me. That guy has grown so much since I got him. This is also going to be the fastest plant tour ever for how many plants I have to share. So we've got a pothos at the top, monstera, some orchids. I think that is a philodendron, the, the lemon lime off to the side or lime. I forget what that one is called. We've got a, you can see the humidifier going off to the side. I've been dealing with spider mites on an alocasia, which you'll see in just a moment. Nothing I've been doing is working. And I don't, I don't, I don't know why they, spider mites love alocasia. So moving forward, I will only have those in vivariums where there's super high humidity because he's got an attitude. We've got a zebra plant in the background there. That guy really likes this humidity. He's also a bit of a drama queen, only wants distilled water. You can't water those with tap water. We've got another of my begonias there. I've only got three. This one I got on eBay. And he's really pretty. I just loved the colors. He's not done a lot of growth since I got him. He's kind of just I think he's got a couple new leaves, but mostly stayed the same. Here is a mother of pearl begonia. This guy, look at, come and focus. There we go. Look at those leaves. This was the first one. This is the one that got me started with, I really think I want begonia to learn how to keep begonias alive. So far it's been going well. I've just got the three, so I ran out of room. I think, I think, I think I'm pretty comfortable with the three I have now. I can probably, hopefully keep myself from buying too many more. We've got my plant stand again. If you recognize some of these plants, let me know because I don't even remember some of the names of these. Obviously, I know the orchids because I've had those forever. There's a larger monstera, which is still fairly tiny for how big monstera can get. Some more of the orchids. And down at the very bottom middle there, that is my monstera siltipicana. That's my one of my favorite, favorite plants I own. I love that guy. Some African violets. I've got a Prince of Orange philodendron in a cage, so he can't get away. There were some attempts. I finally had enough. 
cage that booger up. Um, I'm not sure what some of the names of the other ones are in, are in there. Here is my rapid for tetrasperma in those little jars. I'm propagating that one because the one, and you'll see him, he's out in the dining area. He, he, he got big. He reached the ceiling and then flopped over. So that guy had to be propagated. Here's a vivarium I'm working on for my dart frogs. It's currently in progress, but I thought I'd give you a little view. Eventually that will look like a tree once the moss comes in. So I'm going for more of a surreal landscape. Got a cliff in the background. I've got an area where you'll see, it looks like a cave, but you can't see it yet, but light will come through it. It's in progress, like I said, just waiting for some of this stuff to grow out. There's no frogs or anything in here. I want to let it really establish. This is a bioactive vivarium, so I've got to let the springtails and, and moss, everything needs to grow in there. Got a few more plants here. A pothos, an aglianema, and a... My brain just shut down again. I forget the last one. I'll remember in a second. Golden pothos, one of my older plants. He's huge. We've got an orchid and a tiny terrarium where I've been growing some cutouts for my bigger vivariums. Did I say cutouts? Cuttings. Cuttings is what I'm growing, not cutouts. That's not the same thing at all. Let's see behind it. You can see, okay, I, I filmed this part long enough. We can move on. Why am I focused on that? That orchid came from Stacy. That was when she dropped off for me. Behind those, we've got another marble queen pothos. A syndapsis, we've got, there is the Rapidophora tetrasperma. That is the one I had to take cuttings from because he reached the roof. I'm gonna turn him into a bigger full plant. That African violet in the middle there, that is the first time he's flowered for me. I've had him for three years. I don't know what kind of plant that cow looking dog is in the bottom. This plant in the middle, this is my Monstera Addisonii. This one Stacy brought for me. Had to get him a super fancy teal pot there. Look at him, he's one of my favorites. I love Addisonii, they're just, they have holes, they're beautiful, I love him. We've got a Syngonium at the bottom there. This is a Monstera Albo, for, for, I can't say it, it's a cutting that is having an attitude and not wanting to grow a, a root. Stacy bought him, she couldn't get him to root, he kept rotting, so she's having me give him a chance, he's on perlite. Fingers crossed, everyone send happy thoughts to that cutting because they're stupid expensive to replace. Here we've got another aglionema. He has lived on my refrigerator for years in my apartment and here, and he seems to not even care that he doesn't get much light. He's just happy up there. One of the most underrated plants, in my opinion. Aglionema, look into them. They come in tons of colors, and they do well in most environments. There is my vivarium that the red-eyed tree frogs will go in. We've got just all kinds of stuff. I can't even start to list off. There's some some fancy stuff in there I'm pretty excited about, and that concludes today's fastest plant tour ever. Have you subscribed yet? If not, I've got a handy button right there. It's round, has an orange arrow going towards it. If you click on that, that will help you to keep up to date with all of my new videos every single week.